speaks shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of every lie. There is no escape. Proverbs 19.5 I will tell the truth for every lie Proverbs 19 5 A false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape A false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape Proverbs 19 5 Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler66, Hour of the Truth. This is part 4 of the Origin of Futurism and Preterism, reading and discussing of the booklet with uh, Joggler66 from Hour of the Truth and my brother in Christ in the United States of America, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, who was joining me after we just took a little break and now doing this fourth uh, broadcast on this reading and discussion. I will continue um, this, um, uh, on the second paragraph on page 13 and um, then you can enjoy our reading and discussion of the book, the fourth part, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. Enjoy. Leroy Froome in his book The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers in volume 2 confirms the foregoing facts of history. Quote, Rome's answer to the Protestant Reformation was twofold, though actually conflicting and contradictory, through the Jesuits Ribera of Salamanca in Spain and Bellarmine of Rome the papacy put forth her futurist interpretation, and through Alcazar, Spanish Jesuit of Seville, she advanced almost simultaneously the conflicting preterist interpretation. These were designed to meet and overwhelm the historical interpretation of the Protestants. Now comes the sentence that I highlighted in my book in this quote. Listen carefully. Though mutually exclusive, either Jesuit alternative suited the great objective equally well as both thrust aside the application of the prophecies from the existing Church of Rome. The one accomplished it by making prophecy stop altogether short of paper Rome's career. The other achieved it by making it overleap the immense era of papal dominance, crowding Antichrist into a small fragment of time in the still distant future, just before the great consummation. It is consequently often called the gap theory. End of this quote. And again, like in the first well, part, I'd like to welcome my brother Tom Fress, who joins me in this broadcast in the next reading of The Origin of Futurism and Preterism, of which I just read to you the most important paragraph on page 13. And I think that Tom, as I, will have some comments on this little paragraph that I just read. Hello, Tom, and welcome to the <coughs> broadcast. Yes, uh, good evening, Mirk, and uh, nice to be with you and your listeners. And uh, this, this brief paragraph simply restates what we've been saying uh, since the beginning, that uh, though they are mutually exclusive, in other words, you can't hold to the preterist view and the, historic, or the, the futurist view at the same time because they contradict one another. Look, let me ask you a question. If you ask your son to tell you the truth and you ask him a specific question about a specific thing and he answers you with contradictions is he telling you the truth or is he lying lying well he's lying obviously yeah. futurism and preterism have a common origin the jesuits who are in charge of the Counter-Reformation, the war against Protestantism. They created preterism 
they created futurism and taught them within the Roman Catholic Church to silence dissent within the Roman Catholic Church the accusation that the papacy is the Antichrist. Well, let me... That's how let, let me just interrupt you a little ahead. bit because if it weren't such su such a tragic, it would be actually be funny. In the Bible, we read, "A house divided in itself cannot stand." That's how we know what Jesus was speaking of. Again and again and again, history shows us how true Jesus' words were. Yes. And this is just another example. When the Roman Catholic Church, who calls herself the apostolic, the only true church, out of which there is no salvation, and the Pope is declared infallible in 1870, and they teach mutually exclusive dogmas of the Antichrist's identity, how can they be even believed? by anybody the answer to to this paragraph is how can we get it wrong <laughs> yeah, that's right yeah. Yeah. how can we get it wrong preterism and futurism contradict one another it leaves you only one other alternative the historicist interpretation of bible prophecy it's the only one that makes sense it's the only one that explains all of history through the entire church age that the book of Revelation chronicles events, prophecies being fulfilled all throughout the church age. Let me ask you a question, Tom. You just asked me about this, if my son would tell me uh, about a certain event and I would see that, that he is lying. Let me ask you this. Yeah. When people see that futurism must be a lie, because of everything that we have said already in the earlier broadcasts, and preterism is a lie, why don't they turn to historicism, back to the Bible, but choose, but choose, not given that but choose one of the two lies that gives them the most comfort? That's something that I just don't understand. They are choosing, and you can, you can transfer this into so many aspects of life, like in politics, choosing the lesser of two evils. We were speaking in, part, uh, in, in the earlier part of our reading here about this L. Smith dinner and about how the Cardinal of New York introduced Hillary Clinton on the one side and Donald Trump on the other. And the people yeah. who are going to vote know that they are going to vote for some brown-colored not-good thing that is going to rule their country. And they still go and choose the quote-unquote lesser of two evil instead of doing the right no. thing and going not to vote instead of going and following the futurist agenda or the preterist agenda choosing the historicist not agenda but the word of god and turn to god and repent of their ignorance well just like in politics there are only two candidates running for president of Bible prophecy, preterism and futurism. And you always have to choose the lesser of two evils. The third candidate isn't even talked about in the churches. Historicism, it's not an option. The churches either teach preterism or futurism, and they fight amongst themselves about which error to believe in. They both preach smooth things, the Bible calls them, smooth things. In preterism, we don't have to worry about the Antichrist. He's long dead and gone, Nero and the old pagan Roman Empire. What we have now is the kingdom of Christ under the Pope. It's all good, right? In futurism, we don't have to worry about the Antichrist. He won't come until the last seven years, and besides that, we'll all be raptured out before he gets here. Smooth things. Good news, right? What could be bad about the Antichrist coming to torment sinners? Because all the 
Christians will be gone, right? Raptured out. The Christians don't have to suffer persecution. Of course, to believe that, you have to throw your Bible away, and you have to hit, throw away true history, because we know throughout the entire history of the Christian era, for 2,000 years, God's people have suffered persecution. And who were they? Historicists. It's the option that you're not given in the churches today. So nobody's persecuted today. You can go to church every Sunday. You can practice futurism or, or preterism, either one. There's no persecution. But if you believe in historicism, then you are Protestant. You protest the Antichrist and his, and his control over the governments of the world. And you begin to protest, then you get persecuted by both the preterists and the futurists and the papists. Everybody. Such has been the case of God's people for 2,000 years. If you didn't believe the preterist lie, if you didn't believe the futurist lie, and you believe the Pope was the Antichrist, the Pope sent the Inquisition to silence dissent within the Roman Catholic Church. But then along came the Protestant Reformation, and hordes and hordes and hordes of Roman Catholics flooded out of the Roman Catholic Church, so much so that it became the common knowledge in Europe the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. Catholics left the Roman Catholic Church in droves. Roman Catholic presidents and queens and kings of Europe rebelled against the Pope, left the Roman Catholic Church in droves, and began to write their own constitutions upholding Protestant liberties. And they even left Europe, Tom, and came over to the New World, United States of America. And what did Rome do? Sent the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation. Look, it's dangerous to be a historicist. It's dangerous to be a Protestant, because Rome's got the upper hand again. Because Protestants forgot what they protested. And futurism and preterism, those two alternatives created by the Roman Catholic Church to bring about silence of dissent. Well, now nobody's persecuted except those who have always been persecuted, historicists. I don't totally agree with you, Tom, there, but that, that's normal, you know, because from a worldly view, you are absolutely right. But to be either a preterist or a futurist, that is the big danger. To be a historicist, okay, you are being persecuted, but so what? We don't fear the one who can destroy the flesh here on earth, but who can destroy flesh and uh, flesh and soul, a body and soul in, yeah. uh, in, in hell for all eternity, right? So we yeah. better take a stand right here and get ourselves righteous through being washed by the blood of Christ who died for our sins and will reward us in heaven for what we are doing here. We will not receive a reward in this world. No, we surely will not. And the people who persecute us will think they do God's work. Jesus yeah. said it. They will throw you out of the synagogues. They will persecute you and they will kill you. And they will even think they do God's works. You know, Tom, I'm reading for the moment yep. the book History of the Inquisition, and something became very clear to me. I just could not grasp that all these people who did all the atrocities during the Inquisition, even though I'm not that far in the book yet, but when I go back to this, and I have watched movies about the Inquisition as you have, and read books about it as you have, uh, taking a look at Fox's Book of Martyrs and, and, and all that stuff. Yeah, It's... <sighs> Tears come to your eyes when you read things like this. But yeah. I could not understand that people were persecuting and torturing other men, their brethren. In God's name. And, 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 and just being cruel. They had to have the conviction that they were doing God's work. Otherwise, yeah. they could not have done it. I don't think that any man 
really in his in the bottom of his heart a few probably but most of them could not have been so cruel the whole world in the middle ages did not consist all of sadists who loved to torture other people they must have thought they really did god's work so that's right how does that come that they think they do god's work when they do a persecution like that they, they don't know the, the, the bible oh. tom they don't know god's oh. word they follow man and they make man their god and that yeah. is the big mistake and that mistake from the middle ages we have today again donald trump is made the god of america and pope francis mm -hmm. is made the god of this world because yeah. the people just follow him instead of opening the book which God wrote for us. Yeah. Our manual through life is the Holy Writ, is the 1611 mm -hmm. authorized King James Version of the Bible. And when we read that, and when we read that, we are given the possibility to make the right choice and to leave futurism for what it is, and to leave preterism for what it is, and to leave organized churches for what they are, and to leave politics for what it is, but to turn to Jesus Christ. History confirms that we have the right interpretation of Bible prophecy. History confirms that histor the historicism is the correct school of Bible prophecy interpretation. <clears throat> and we find all those who died in the tortures of the Inquisitions were those who held to the, the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy, who saw the papacy as the man of sin and the Roman Catholic Church as the synagogue of Satan. And they would not follow the voice of a false shepherd they only follow the voice of their true shepherd, Jesus. And their blood still cries to God from the ground upon which it was spilt, calling for justice. How long, O oh Lord, will you allow our blood to cry from the dust of the ground? How long before you take justice and vengeance upon the ones who so unrighteously slew us and tortured us and made our lives a living hell for professing you and you only? That's right, Yerk. When they killed the saints of Almighty God, they thought they were performing a mandate issued from God. They thought they were doing God's service because they falsely believed that the papacy was the very seat of God on the earth. That Jesus Christ passed down his divinity. That Jesus Christ passed down his, his infallibility and his atoning power and vested it all in the papacy. It's a lie to end all lies. When you understand the preterist view correctly, we are living in the kingdom of Christ right now. That's what I'm going to tell you one That's thing, true. Tom. If this world that I'm living in, when I look outside, whether through the television or any news media, or just go outside of the world, and this is the kingdom of Christ, then I don't want the kingdom of Christ. How do they ever succeed in selling that? I don't get it. Is there anybody who sees how this could be the kingdom of Christ with all the wars and the rumors of wars, with all the starvation, the um, sodomite agenda, the pedophile Vatican agenda and all that stuff? How can anybody think we are living in the kingdom of Christ? There's no answer to that question. So. It's just unbelievable that people 
It's inexplicable. Yeah, it's inexplicable that people can believe such a lie. But on the other hand, the Bible gives us the answer, Tom. Because the Bible right. says, I will send them strong delusion. That they would believe they a lie. Would believe a lie. And why would he do that? Well, because people became ignorant and because people left the small path that left to that that leads to salvation they did yeah. not follow the word of god anymore even though they profess yeah. him but jesus had an answer to that too he said when they say to him did we not prophesy your name did we not heal and all, all this stuff and he said uh, turn away from me, you that work iniquity. Yeah. The Bible has all the answers. It's just astounding. Even when you say, oh, I can't answer this. Yeah, no, you can. Just read the Bible. And the Bible has all the answers to every question you have ever had. That's why the Jesuits don't want us to read the Bible. The true Bible. They want us to read the NIV, which I've just learned a few days ago in the 2011 edition, has a person before Pilate called Jesus Barabbas. That Bible they want us to read, because that Bible we will never understand. Yeah. yeah. I've always asked myself, <clears throat> how would a preterist who believed that the Antichrist was either Nero or Caligula of the old Roman Empire what do they do with the passage of scriptures that says there will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes? Obviously, they believe that the papacy is the Prince of Peace. So how do they explain all the wars exactly. of the world Un under the papacy? Constant conflict. Every day. War. Everywhere. If not a shooting war, an arguing war. An economic war. An ethnic war. A racial war. An economic war. Everywhere, a war. All the time. Steeped in war. Every day. All day long. What? How do the predators say that if Nero was the Antichrist, the papacy must be the prince of peace, then why so much war? Maybe some of the preterists are beginning to think he's not the prince of peace. And so they jump over to the futurist side. But who jumps into the historicist side? so that they can explain all of history and the wars and who the Antichrist is and how he operates in the world today, yesterday and today and up until the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, returns. And there be no peace as long as the man of sin rules in Rome. And there will be no peace until Jesus returns to destroy him. That's the historical and the biblical interpretation of Bible prophecy. You can't make sense out of the scriptures or history if you believe in futurism. You can't understand the scriptures or history if you believe in preterism. But if you're an historicist, you have no questions, only answers. And confirmation. Yes, and confirmation to boot. All right, I'm going to continue on the bottom of page 13. Concerning the two alternatives presented by Rabira and Alcazar, speaking of futurism and preterism, consigning Antichrist either to the remote past or future, Joseph Tenner, the Protestant writer, gives this record. And I already mentioned him before. He wrote the book on the, on the prophecy of Daniel. 
Daniel and the Revelation, that book is called. And he quotes, Accordingly, toward the close of the century of the Reformation, two of her most learned doctors set themselves to the task, each endeavouring by different means to accomplish the same end, namely, that of diverting men's minds from the perceiving the fulfilment of the prophecies of the Antichrist in the papal system. Now, I have to read the sentence again because this is very important. Listen closely. Right. Listen very, very closely. Accordingly, toward the close of the century of the Reformation, two of her most learned doctors set themselves to the task, each endeavoring by different means to accomplish the same end, namely that of diverting men's minds diverting men's minds from perceiving the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Antichrist in the papal system. The Jesuit Alcazar devoted himself to bring into prominence the preterist method of interpretation, which we have already briefly noticed, and thus endeavored to show that the prophecies of Antichrist were fulfilled before the Pope's ever even ruled at Rome, and therefore could not apply to the papacy. On the other hand, the Jesuit Ribera tried to set aside the application of these prophecies to the papal power by bringing out the Futurist system, which asserts that these prophecies refer properly not to the career of the papacy, but to that of some future supernatural individual maybe some kind of Superman comes down from planet Krypton, who is yet to appear and to continue in power for three and a half years. Thus, as Alford says, the Jesuit Ribera about AD 1580 may be regarded as the founder of the futurist system in modern times. Unquote. This is very important because this admission that Ribera may be admitted uh, or may be regarded as the founder of the futurist system in modern times actually confirms what Tom has said all the way that the futurist agenda was within the Roman Catholic Church already taught from the beginning when within the clergy there were people who by reading the Bible when they were allowed to came to the understanding that the papacy was the Antichrist. But the futurist teaching <coughs> in the modern times, that was based on Jesuit Ribera. Now, Tom, I'm... The Jesuits, the Jesuits would love us to believe, and they made it public, that they were the ones who came up with futurism and preterism. But information that I've seen on the Internet from writings of ancient <clears throat> of the ancient Roman Catholic Church fathers dealt with both preterism and futurism. Of course, they weren't known as preterism and futurism, but the earliest uh, sages within the Roman Catholic Church had to exonerate the papacy. After all, he is the fountain of the Catholic Church. He's the fountain of their faith. Without the Pope, there is no Roman Catholic Church. That's why they call it popery. Okay? That's why Roman Catholicism by the Protestant Reformers was referred to as popery. If you take the Pope out of the Roman Catholic Church, there is no Roman Catholic Church. All the power of the priests are vested in the Pope, and the priests get their power to transubstantiate the wafer into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ can't be done by the priest without the authority of the Pope. Okay? So it, it was always the career of the sages, the learned fathers of the Roman Catholic Church, to gather up allegiance to their King of Kings and Lord of Lords, their Christ on earth. And so they had to, when they came to reading the passages about the Antichrist, they had to describe it as someone other than the Pope. I mean, this is just common sense. Roman Catholic teachers have always taught that the Antichrist was either 
one of the ancient pagan Roman emperors, such as Nero and or Caligula, or one of the other most atrocious of the Caesars of the, Ro of, of the old ancient Roman Empire, which would make sense to Roman Catholics because they regard their pope as the Prince of Peace, the Vicar of Christ, the very foundation of, of the heavenly host. So naturally, they would try to find a sin in history to point their finger at someone other than the Pope of being the Antichrist because their salvation depended upon the Pope being their Christ and the Roman Catholic Church. They had to teach Roman Catholics how to answer the question, who is the Antichrist? Who is this man of sin? Who's the little horn that Daniel's speaking about? Well, you ask a Roman Catholic sage, he's going to point his finger at anybody but the Pope. So this is the ancient teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. It didn't begin with Ribera or Alcazar. Ribera and Alcazar just resurrected it and made it available, these, these, these pro-papal teachings made them available in the Protestant churches. Common sense dictates that the Vatican always had to protect, preserve its true identity, had to protect its true identity. The papacy couldn't allow the world to come into the grips that the papacy is the Antichrist, the man of sin, son of perdition. So they had to play, place the blame or the onus of Antichrist either on an ancient Roman emperor or somebody that hasn't even come yet. And the farther away they can put him, the better. That leaves the Pope unchallenged. That's what preterism and futurism accomplish. They are both necessary because neither one, either preterism or futurism, answer all the Bible prophecies. Together, they don't answer all the Bible prophecies. Only historicism does. And historicism puts its finger squarely on the nose of the papacy and won't take it off. There's no division in the house of historicism. There's no division in the Protestant house of God. There's perfect understanding understanding of the scriptures, understanding of prophecy, and understanding of history. There's no contradiction. There's no grounds for disagreement. That had to be destroyed. Futurism and preterism had to be made the most popular schools of Bible interpretation so that historicism would be replaced. That's how you destroy the Protestant Reformation, by destroying historicism destroying the word of God. And the Jesuits the Jesuits knew the Jesuits knew that the only weapon that they had ever seen that could destroy historicism was futurism and preterism. It was used historically within the Roman Catholic Church. Now it has to be used outside the Roman Catholic Church. And no better place to have it preached than from Protestant pulpits. Historicist pulpits. And that's literally what's happened. It worked to silence dissent anciently within the Roman Catholic Church. And it has silenced the dissent against the papacy in the Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation is a thing of the past. It's been defeated. There's nothing but smoke and ash. Protestantism has self-emulated itself. And Rome won't even take the blame. I mean, it's after all, it was the Protestants themselves who said, the Antichrist is future, or the Antichrist is the long distant past. Never comprehending that they were destroying the very foundation upon which they were built, and their entire faith exists. Protestantism is built on the foundation Number one, that Jesus is the Christ and that the Pope is his Antichrist. 
the counterfeit Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. That's Protestantism. And Protestants just immolated themselves. Mm. You know, what I just think, Tom, is uh, when we go to the Bible and we read in the Law and the Prophets, what most people call the Old Testament, we can see yeah. that the whole Old Testament then points to the coming of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, I think it is right to say that the Law and the Prophets, or the Old Testament, point to the coming of Christ, and that the New Testament points to the coming of Antichrist. And that sure we does. know that there is a fight between the good and the bad. Because that's what yep. we can read in Genesis, the first book of Moses, chapter 3, verse 15. He will bruise your heel, and uh, you will bruise his heel, and he will crush your head. The seed of yep. the woman. So it yep. was made to us that there is a war going on. And all through the so called Old Testament, Everything points to the coming of a Messiah, especially, not only, not exclusively, but especially Daniel 9, verses 24 yeah. through 27. And this false yeah. interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, the last verse, to put that in the future, is the success of the Jesuits to not getting you the knowledge, to not giving you the knowledge that you can identify who your enemy is. Because that's yeah. what it's all about. Futurism, yeah. Tom said one time, a very profound sentence that I read down. Futurism is the victory of Romanism over Protestantism. And yep. the ecumenical movement ends in the capitulation of Protestantism. And that's yep. the times that we are living in. That's the times that we see. So the whole Old Testament had at least that one goal, to show everyone where his salvation comes from. Jesus, the Messiah. And then we see yep. the, oh, the teaching. And Tom, you know, we have been doing a Bible study every Sabbath, two, sometimes even three hours. We are in the book of Corinthians right now. And we haven't read one uh, chapter. We are up until chapter 6 in 1 Corinthians. We haven't read one chapter that does not deal with the Antichrist. When you read it That's with right. the right understanding that you can only right. get from the 1611 King James yep. Bible. That, my dear listener, is the reason why this Bible is attacked from every side why it has been falsified why all other bibles come out why today you have to choose you can choose between i don't know 100 200 300 different kinds of bibles you can even buy a queen james bible can you believe it you can even yeah. buy a queen james bible all to divert you from the true word of Christ. And this works all hand in hand together. The education system in our schools and universities, the preaching from the pulpits and the Protestant and Roman Catholic churches, everything that you experience in your life when you watch television or whatever, you are indoctrinated to do anything but read your Bible. The one Bible that really contains the word of God and that will lead you into all truth as Jesus promised because he said it is expedient for me to go because if I do not go I cannot set the comforter who will lead you into all truth. But please people test the spirit. You don't test the spirit anymore and that's why you fall for false spirits. And that's why God sends you a strong delusion that you will believe whether the futurist or the preterist lie instead of turning to the truth. The truth that does not allow a compromise. And we have read two page, uh, a page before that preterism and futurism are mutually exclusive. If you have not understand that, whether from the reading 
nor from Tom's or my comments during this broadcast, I think, I think you will never get it. They are mutually exclusive. That means they are both identified as a lie. Only the truth can stand without compromise. Because the moment yeah. the truth goes into compromising, it is not the truth anymore. The ecumenical movement is nothing else but compromise. Yeah. You got any more comments, Tom, or shall I continue reading? No, just compromise with the man of sin. That's what it is. And none of it would be possible. None of this. Vatican Council II, the ecumenical movement, and the current wars that we're fighting. None of them would be possible were it not for futurism and preterism. If Protestantism was still historicist in its interpretation and understanding of the Bible and of history, none of the things that I just mentioned would be possible. Vatican Council II would have been an impossibility. Ecumenical reunion with the Roman Catholic Church would be an impossibility. And marshalling the human resources, the financial resources, the material resources, the, the, the military resources of the United States could never have been harnessed by the papacy to conquer the rest of the world for the Pope's new world order. Look at the cost of forgetting who the Antichrist is. Look at the cost in blood and in guts and in bullets and in money and in materiel and the spiritual cost. The papacy has turned the United States into a battle axe for the Pope. Because we forgot who the Antichrist is. We forgot who the Antichrist was. And we forgot who the Antichrist ever will be. The papacy. And we'll pay the price. We'll continue to pay the price. In blood. And in guts. And in bullets. And in bombs and spiritual death because we won't repent of our futurist errors. We won't repent of our preterist errors and still we maintain the idea that we're going to advance the Christian world all over this world. It's not Christianity at all. It's the kingdom of Antichrist. Literally restoring the papacy to the power that it had during the Dark Ages. That's what the New World Order is. It's simply the old world restored on a global scale. And without the United States, without the ecumenical evangelical bellies joining with the Roman Catholic Church to conquer the whole world for the Pope, it wouldn't be possible. The papacy would still be the man of sin. He would still be the son of perdition. He would still be the Antichrist. He would be forbidden for ever setting foot on this country, on this land, much less giving a, a sermon to the, to the House floor, the house floor in, in, in the Congress. Never would the Pope be invited to this country to celebrate his birthday as they did in 2008. Never would an Archbishop of New York become the military vicar of the United States Armed Forces. Never would a potentate of the Roman Catholic Church, a priest of the, ped of the Roman Catholic Church, be allowed to pedophile our, our children without going to jail. Never would we tolerate 
the idolatries of the Roman Catholic Church, the mariolatries of the Roman Catholic Church, the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, the Eucharist of the Roman Catholic Church, none of it would be a possibility. There would be no Roman Catholic in any position of power in this country. And there would certainly be no Jesuit, whether in full Jesuit dress or in costume, parading, left alone to parade freely around this country. Look at the cost of futurism. Look at the cost of preterism. Look what it has cost you. Shall we stop the arterial bleeding? You want peace and prosperity and basic Protestant rights to be restored in this once Protestant land? Then you better return to Protestantism. You better return to historicism. And if not, you get what you deserve. You see, Israel had a choice. They didn't have to go into Syrian captivity. All they had to do was break down their images and idols. Judah had a choice. They didn't have to go into Babylonian captivity. All they had to do was quit worshiping the rising sun, break down all their images and idols, and restore God's law. But they wouldn't do it. And all the United States has to do is to repudiate futurism and preterism, return to historicism, and knock down all the idolatrous churches in this country. Will they do it? No. And you might ask, Tom, why do you strain your voice every day to do, to attempt to do what you know is never going to happen? Well, maybe I just like beating my head against the wall. I hate to be so down on God's people. Look, God's word will not return unto him void. If only one person who hears my voice today and understands what I say is, what I'm saying re repudiates the, the ecumenical movement gets out of the of the so-called Protestant churches and worships God in spirit and in truth, then my time wasn't wasted. My voice will be restored. My hope will be restored. But I don't expect a huge following. Rome is where they want to go. They love the pomp and the circumstance, the gold and the pillars and the priests and the nuns and the sacraments and the sacrifice of the mass. Let them go. Just like Ephraim. Turn to idols. Leave him alone. But God's going to call out a sacred people for his name that will never bend the knee to the bail in Rome. And as few as they may be, they will champion the name of Christ and him only. And they'll do it to their dying day and take their place with the martyrs. <clears throat> Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Your exaltation there made me quite speechless that's good that i have a book in front of me that i can read so i don't have to think for myself for the moment because this what you've just elaborated on is really something to let sink in a little bit and think about it so i would even advise my viewers to maybe pause the video at this moment and think a little bit about what tom just said and maybe you can find the truth in what he said because every word that he just spoke was the truth whether you like it or you don't that doesn't change the fact. Now we're going to give him a little break with his voice, and I'm going to continue reading in the book on the bottom of page 14. The author continues and says, E.B. Elliot states precisely the same fact that we were just reading about, the, uh, the Jesuit Ribera, 
<coughs> who may be regarded as the founder of the futurist system in modern times, E.B. Elliot states precisely the same fact, only assigning slightly different dates, and many others, such as Dr. Candish of Edinburgh, also supports the charges. Thus, the fact is established. Now, the author calls E.B. Elliot here with the title Reverend E.B. Elliot, and I don't use the word reverend because a synonym for reverend is hallowed, venerable, sacred, and venerated. And um, you can, it's like calling someone your father, and we should only call one man our father, uh, one our father who is in heaven. So I just leave it with E.B. Elliot. He quote, uh, quoted by Froome in the preceding paragraph is that great English scholar from Cambridge University. In his four-volume literary masterpiece, Hore Apocalyptice, which stands for an hour with the apocalypse, not for hurrah, uh -huh, for if you don't understand that, hurrah means the hour, or a commentary on the, uh, on the apocalypse, meaning the revelation, critical and historical, from this literally masterpiece, Eliot supports the evidence thus far that both preterist and futurist interpretations of prophecy originated with Rome. Here follows a lengthy okay, before quote. Before you read the quote, and before, yeah, I just uh, wanted to say, please, please. Uh, before I do this, yeah, please, Tom. Yeah. Please, please I, I, I just want everybody to know that the preeminent work of, of examining the book of Revelation and showing the historical fulfillment of those prophecies throughout the Christian era for the last 2,000 years, proving the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy as correct, remembering that prophecy is literally history written in advance. God has the power to foresee the future and Bible prophecy is foretelling the future. So, to in order to identify prophecy as having been fulfilled, you have to see its fulfillment in history. The preterists believe all Bible prophecy was fulfilled prior to the 400 A.D. The futurists say that Bible prophecy won't be fulfilled until the last seven years or three and a half years before Christ's return. E.B. Elliot shows the historical fulfillment of the book of Revelation throughout the 2,000 years that have transpired through the Christian era and through the reign of Antichrist on the earth. Okay, E.B. Elliot, his work entitled Hore Apocalyptica, or Hour of the Apocalypse, is the defining work. Everybody cites and quotes E.B. Elliot. <clears throat> of anybody of any note who is discussing the, bu the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, as it's called by some, they quote from E.B. Elliot. It's like if, if you want to know anything about God, you quote the Bible, right? Now, I don't misquote me. I'm not saying that E.B. Elliot's Hore apocalyptical, uh, Hore apocalyptica is equivalent to the Bible, but it is the the crowning work on any syn uh, synopsis or interpretation of the Book of Revelation. It is championed as the masterpiece uh, of the Book of Revelation, explaining the Book of Revelation in historic terms, showing the historical fulfillment of of the visions and, and, and the prophecies of the book of Revelation. All other works pale in comparison. So the go-to guy to understand the correct interpretation of the book of Revelation is E.B. Elliot and his work, four-volume work entitled Hore Apocalyptica. All right, now back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. And um, I couldn't have said it better, actually. We have to consider that um, this book Hore Apocalyptica, if I'm not mistaken, was written in this uh, in the 16th century, at the end of the 16th century, if I'm not mistaken, right? Or was it the 17th century? Oh, I can't remember the exact date, but it was he was a scholar at Cambridge University, mm -hmm. so it was about the time it was about the time that uh, that uh, the Jesuits were launching the, their futurist lies. 
in the Protestant seminary. 1862. So this is how this is. You could you could see this as God's literal answer to all the lies. 1862. God rose up a God rose up a man by the name of E. B. Eliot to shout down the futurists, to shout down the Protestants, to shout or rather to shout down the preterists, and to shout down the Jesuit-led Counter Reformation. Okay, it was a it, it, it was. It, in, in a sense, you could you could almost call him as God's single combat warrior. He was the David against the Roman Catholic Goliath when it come to interpreting the Book of Revelation. Okay, he single handedly destroyed the Counter Reformation, or at least gave us the ammunition to destroy it. If we'd have just picked it up and gone to battle against Rome yeah, with it. Yeah, but that's like picking up the f a gift of free salvation that Jesus offers that people don't take. Yeah. <laughs> they don't well. take the one or the other, Tom. So the Jesuits launched the Counter-Reformation, <clears throat> and God launched E.B. Eliot's Horae Apocalyptica. Yeah. Let's just put yeah, it yeah, that, that way. Yeah, that was written in the 19th century, published in the middle of 19th century. I just uh, mixed it up with the Fox's Book of Martyrs. That was from the end of the 16th yeah. century. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do this lengthy quote, which goes over two pages, 15 and 16. Here it comes. It was stated that at the conclusion of my sketch of the history of apocalyptic interpretation, that there are present two, and but two, grand general counter schemes to what may be called the, histori uh, the historic Protestant view of the apocalypse. That view, which regards the prophecy as a prefiguration of the of the great events that were to happen in the church and the world connected with it from St. John's time to the consummation, including specially the establishment of the, pope, of the popedom and reign of papal Rome as in some way or other the fulfillment of the types of apocalyptic beast of, and Babylon. The first of these two counter schemes is the preterists, which would have the prophecy stop altogether short of the popedom explaining it of the catastrophes, one or both, of the Jewish nation and pagan Rome, and of which there are two sufficiently distinct varieties. The second, the Futurists, which in its original form which in its original form would have it all shoot over the head of the Pope then into times yet future, and refer simply to the events that are immediately to precede or to accompany. Christ's second event, or in its various modified forms, have them for its chief subject. I shall in this second part of my appendix proceed successively to examine these two, or rather four, anti Protestant counter schemes, and show, if I mistake not, the palpable unten untenableness alike of one and all. Which done? It may, <clears throat> which done it may perhaps be well from respect to his venerated name to add an examination of the late Dr. Arnold's general prophetic counter-theory. This, together with the notice of a certain recent counter-views of the millennium, will complete our review of counter-prophetic schemes. Now, with regard to the preterist scheme, on the review of which we are first to enter, it may be remembered that I stated it have to had its origin with the Jesuit Alcazar, and that it was subsequent, subsequently, and after Grotius and Hammond's prior adoption of it, adopted and improved by Bossuet, the papal champion, under one form and uh, under one form and modification, then afterwards under another modification by Herrn Schneider. Eichhorn and others of German critical and generally infidel school of the last half century, followed in our own era by Heinrichs and by Moses Stewart of the United States of America. The two modifications appear to have arisen mainly out of the differences of date assigned to the Apocalypse, whether about the end of Nero's reign or Domitian's. I shall, I think, pretty well exhaust whatever can be thought to call for examination in the system of considering separately first the Neronic or favorite German form of modification of the Preterist scheme as pronounced by Eichhorn, Hook, Heinrichs and Moses Stewart, secondly Bossuet's Domitianic form, 
the one most generally approved, I believe, by Roman Catholics. End quote. Froome makes a... Yeah? So, so, so E.B. Elliot is going to tear down preterism and all of the permutations of preterism. Preterism went through an evolution. Okay, there were various writers that added to the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy. And E.B. Elliot says they are all untenable. And he seeks in his work, as you can imagine, a hore apocalypte, uh, apocalypticate to tear down every one of these. That's why it's a monumental work, but it's an intricate dismantling of, of, of preterism. Okay, and, and then when he's done with preterism, he goes into futurism, too. Okay, back to you. Now, Froome makes a significant observation in the following treatise, though he did not draw overt attention to it, that it was the rationalists who, re who revived and advanced the preterist theory. First, as to preterism's penetrations into Protestantism, we may note that in 1791, J.G. Eichhorn, who lived between 1752 and 1827, the noted German rationalist, revived and republished Alcazar's preterist interpretation. Soon he was joined by other rationalist scholars such as G. H. A. Ewald from 1803 through 1875, G. C. F. Lucke from 1791 through 1855, W. M. I. De Wette from 1780 through 1849, Franz Delitzsch from 1813 through 1890, and Julius Wellhausen from 1844 through 1918. And since 1830, a very important uh, year, don't forget, we mentioned that already earlier, and since 1830, numerous British and American scholars have followed Eichhorn. In 1830, Professor Samuel Lee of Cambridge likewise injected Boswell's preterist interpretation into the discussion. Professor Moses Stewart of Andover, from 1780 through 1855, introduced preterism into the United States about 1842, and Dr. Samuel Davidson reiterated it in England in 1844. These, and many others, all contended with the papacy, that nothing beyond the destruction of pagan Rome and Judaism was intended by the prophecies concerning Antichrist in the Apocalypse. Okay, this... I would comment here, if I were the researcher that I would hope God would make me be, I could research the names that he's just given, and I'll bet you I'd find one common denominator among them all. Rome. I'd almost guarantee you that they were, fut that they were Freemasons. I almost guarantee it. But that's just an aside. We'll leave that for now. I don't want to get into a big discussion about it. But only to say that Freemasonry, above and beyond all of the secret societies, have been about proselytizing and promoting these two alternative Jesuit schemes to overthrow Protestantism. And uh, many of the Protestant pastors in this country who promoted the pres the preterist lie and also the futurist lie are Freemasons. And we could use the rest of the program, the rest of our hour together, to name them. And you'd recognize them. They are Freemasons. But uh, I, having not done the research myself and gone through... One by one, all of these no, names. No, but you don't have to go one by one through all the names, Tom, because uh, it is mentioned here that they were rationalists. Rationalists yes. are linked to the Enlightenment movement that comes That's out right. of the French Revolution. Uh, the that Illuminati. Out of the, the Illuminati. And, and that is, and so and is, that Freemasonry. is Freemasonry. And we all know, Tom, yep. uh, our listeners maybe don't, that's something they can learn, because you said that numerous uh -huh. times. Freemasonry is nothing else but the Protestant arm of the Jesuit order. 
and That's these right. rationalists have nothing else to do but to interpret the work that Alcazar did and to expound on it and by that to destroy historicism. Yeah. So we don't the Jesuits yeah, we don't even have to check all the names man by man. No. We know that they are mentioned here as rationalists and rationalist is something that comes out of Freemasonry. That is a given sure. fact. That's right. So uh, this is these are the ones who promote preterism and futurism within the Protestant world body. Their future they're 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 Freemasons. And, and Freemasonry, if you want to boil it down to just a simple definition, is the Jesuits' way to recruit Protestants to destroy Protestantism. Okay? Roman Catholics were always forbidden to become members of Freemasonry. Freemasonry is uniquely Protestant if they're not atheists. Now they 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 all must swear in a in a, in a belief in a, uh, a a deity a supreme deity, but that that can be Lucifer himself. Freemasonry doesn't care what god you believe in, as long as you believe in a god. And you can believe that Satan too if you want to. You can be a, come a card carrying, well respected Freemason if you believe that Lucifer is God. Okay, that's what's and and unwittingly, Protestants are recruited into Freemasonry. They join Freemasonry. They're the do-gooders in the free in Freemasonry. But it's also Freemasons who occupy positions behind the pulpits of the Protestant churches that promote preterism and futurism. Uh, Billy Graham. Literally, Freemasonry is the Protestant pack mule of futurism and preterism. They're the ones who carry the pro the preterist and the futurist load into the Protestant churches. If you have a if you have a pastor behind the pulpit who had either admits being a Freemason or wears the Masonic ring or demonstrates the Masonic handshake, kick their diabolical butt out of the church. Or even and all that they brought with them. Or even better, take a run yourself. Yep. The, the, the Freemasonry is just the Protestant wing of the Jesuit order. The Counter-Reformation. Their purpose is to destroy Protestantism no matter what. And Rome was so destitute to find enough help to accomplish what they did, they had to rebound Protestants to do their work for them. And that's how Protestantism literally emulated itself. Well, it's just another way to infiltrate Protestantism, Tom. That's just the way they infiltrated and Protestantism. the masters of infiltration are the Jesuits, eh? <laughs> so. yep. They did it through Freemasonry. Yeah. All lies come from Freemasonry. And uh, they're all Vatican lies. It's... it's uh, Protestants who join Freemasonry and swear those bloody oaths cannot profess the name of Jesus Christ out of the same mouth that they profess Freemasonry from. But Rome uses whatever she can, whatever means fair or foul. And Freemasonry has literally been the Pope's pack mule into the Protestant church. And it justifies the means. Yep. Okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry for that, but people need to understand what free, what role Freemasonry has played in the Jesuit-led counter-reformation. I'm sorry for this very important explanation, Tom. Okay, well, it, it's, an, it's, it's, it's an aside that the author didn't mention, but it goes right along with what we're well, talking about. Well, if there's any about. questions about that, I uploaded a few weeks ago a video of you from the ARC, uh, from... Um, when you were in the discussion group after reading Romanism and the Reformation, that you maybe remember, that's two years ago, where you had a discussion with one uh, with one guy who spoke about his family and uh, Freemasons in the church. And right. uh, that video is called Inquisition Update. Freemasons are in the churches. Look it up. It's on my channel. 
you can find it there you can watch it for yourself and that is only one of the many 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 sources that you can get if you want confirmation of that and that's why i threw in the name billy graham because billy graham is a 33rd degree freemason just look at what his ministry achieved in the name yep. of ecumenism and then you know where it comes from uh, the bible says it by their fruits you will know them what fruits yep. bears the tree of billy graham i ask you yep. now continuing in the book maybe we can finish this uh, page and a half in, uh, in this broadcast <laughs> let's see while Froome identifies those who advance preterism as rationalists, it was Eliot who was even more accurate in his description of them. Remember his words, quote, Then afterwards, under another modification by Henschneider, Eichhorn and, other Germans, uh, and others of German critical and generally infidel school of the last half century, followed in our own era by Heinrichs and by Moses Stewart of the United States of America. Unquote. Summation. We come up to some this part of the book a little up before we go into section two. So this is going to be a summation of section one. It is argued that the revelations of Guinness, Tenor, Eliot, Froome and others are simply anti-Catholic vilification and of no historical accuracy. Well, that's the same a lot of people like to accuse Tom and me of. Oh, yeah, they like to dismiss us by calling us Catholic bashers. On the con Nothing of the kind. No, nothing of the kind. On the contrary, the author continues, Roman Catholics as well as Protestants agree. Roman Catholics as well as Protestants agree as to the origin of these interpretations. The Roman Catholic writer G. S. Hitchcock writes, quote, The futuristic school, founded by Jesuit Ribera in 1591, looks for Antichrist, Babylon, and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of the Christian dispensation. The preterist school, founded by Jesuit Alcazar in 1614, explains the revelation by the fall of Jerusalem or by the fall of pagan Rome in 410 AD. Unquote. From a Roman Catholic writer, G. S. Hitchcock. <sighs> George S. Hitchcock, The Beasts and the Little Horn, London Catholic Truth Society Publications, 1911, page 7. You can look that up yourself. Yep. It is from the horse's mouth itself. I have been uh, receiving the Catholic Encyclopedia from 1907 through 1913 published from Brother Brett Norman. He sent me that some months ago. And that is a wonderful work to look up references. When you do really want to do your own research you have to read what the roman catholic church publishes itself and when you compare what is in that roman catholic encyclopedia on the one hand and what the word of god says on the other hand it is quite clear who is on the right side and who is on the wrong side That's right. but you have to do that research for yourself you don't have to believe me, you don't have to believe Tom, you don't have to believe any of the writers the, um, the author mentions here, Henry Gretton Guinness, Tanner, E.B. Elliot, Froome, or whoever. Do your own research if you think what we tell you, what they research, is not true. And compare everything that we teach and that you learn everything else to the Bible. Just make sure that you take the right Bible and then you will see that everything that we teach on this broadcast you will get confirmation of in your own study. Was there a comment that you wanted to make, Tom? No, no, continue. Okay. Now this Roman Catholic confirmation, it is a confirmation from Mr. Hitchcock 
of the origins of futurism and preterism validates the writings of Froome, Eliot, Guinness and others. So, when the Roman Catholic Church or Roman Catholic Church writer validates what these Protestant writers had said, is there any point to argue? Who, is there any... who are we or anyone else to argue? Everyone's in agreement. The Vatican admits that futurism and preterism are the artistries of their Jesuits. Who are we to argue? We just have to take there's no we argument. We just have to take that information in, whether we like it or we don't. That's right. Now, to answer the question posed at the beginning of this booklet concerning the origin of futurist and preterist views of prophecy, all of the writers quoted are in agreement. Rome is guilty. While the original question has been answered, it should be pointed out that at this late date that as this sorry it should be pointed out that at this late date in history the political and spiritual ramifications from either of these errors should be carefully considered by all okay that's what i was alluding to earlier before the you break were. it literally takes your breath yeah. away when you begin to consider the political and religious consequences of preterism and futurism. The political and spiritual ramifications of either of these errors, futurism or preterism, should be carefully considered by all. That's what should be the business of all the churches in this country to examine the ramifications of both preterism and futurism. And until the churches of this country make that a priority from the pulpits, this delusion will continue to tally up even incalculable ramifications for God's people. And when, when people... When people hear the stress in my voice, when they hear the passion in my voice, that is a reflection of the calculations that I've done in my own research about the ramifications, the costs, the consequences of preterism and futurism in the body of Christ. It's overwhelming. It literally takes your breath away. This author puts it mildly when he says, it should be pointed out that at this late date in history, the political and spiritual ramifications of either of these errors should be carefully considered by all. It should be carefully considered in Washington, D.C., in the Oval Office of the White House, of the United States of America should be carefully considered on the Supreme Court of the United States of America should be carefully considered within the Congress and the Senate of the United States of America. It should be carefully considered in the schools and in the press and behind the pulpits of every church in this country or this delusion will run its full course. And the ultimate price, the ultimate spiritual and the ultimate political price will be paid. Back to you, Yerk. I will repeat this little paragraph and bring this to a conclusion. While the original question has been answered, it should be pointed out that at this late date in history, the political and spiritual ramifications of from either of these errors, preterism and futurism, should be carefully considered by all. And all means all. The most obvious one is the slow drift back to Rome we see in many of our churches and para-church groups. The slow drift back to Rome that was of course also initiated by the ecumenical movement with the Second Vatican Council in yep. the 1960s of last century. 
for these errors to have grown to the extent seen today, it would appear a substantial segment of our Protestant ministers and theologians have neglected a careful and thorough study of church history and the prophetic word. While none of us has all knowledge, and cherished dogmas are difficult to abandon, it behooves us to listen to the Apostle Paul's word of commendation about the church at Berea. A quote from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 10 through 11. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble men than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Unquote. Searched the scriptures daily. Whenever somebody tells you something of a quote-unquote ecclesiastical dogma, search the scripture for confirmation. Don't take anything for granted. Don't take... And one thing you will not find in scripture, you will not find Jesus passing his scepter to the Pope of Rome. That's right. Jesus passed his scepter to the Holy Spirit and not to the Pope in Rome. So, this has been quite a long session. The second one, not as long as the first, but this is not a contest. We will continue next session in the reading of the book The Origin of Futurism and Preterism on page 20 when we go into section 2 which is called The Development of Preterism and its Interpretation of the Second Coming of Christ. That is going to be mind-boggling and interesting, I can tell you already right now. I want to thank my brother Tom Fress very much for coming to the broadcast here with me, reading and discussing the book The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. Tom, are there any remarks that you want to leave for our, watch, uh, for our viewers and listeners before we say goodbye today? I would only leave your listeners with a blessing. Blessings in the name of the one, the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, our Messiah and Lamb of God, the true and only King of kings and Lord of lords. Thanks, Jerk. Thank you, Tom. When Jesus Christ did come, he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And when he went on the cross, he fulfilled the sacrament, the, um, how do you say that? the um, sacrificial law of Moses. That's what he fulfilled. He became the perfect lamb. He became the one with whose blood our sins were washed away. And he taught us later on through his apostles. He taught us also during his ministry that we can read the 70th week of Daniel in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. He told us and afterwards his apostles told us who the enemy is that we have to look out for. And this book is also dealing with that subject. So next time when we come together we will show you even more of that lie that Rome spreads all through the world. Up to here, I thank you very much for watching, for listening and for commenting. And as always, you can contact Tom directly by sending him an email at tom at seawaves.us tom at seawaves, like the waves of the sea, dot us. And me you can reach via the comment section of the video or send a personal message via YouTube. And of course, Joggler77 via Skype as I quite often mentioned. Up to here, 
Thank you very much for watching and listening. Until next time, God bless you and bye-bye.